Millions are still without power or heat in Texas right now as the National Guard works to get people into warming shelters. We're checking in with Bloomberg News' energy reporter, Rachel Adams Hurd, who's live in Houston for the latest. Rachel, um, first up, uh, what are things like on the ground where you are? Well, the sun has finally come out, so that's a, a welcome addition to today. There's still ice on the roads, and again, a third of the state is without power. Those blackouts have expanded to other parts of the country. Um, so a lot of folks woke up for going on 30 plus hours without electricity. We use uh, heat uh, to warm our homes. And so it's been a really brutal day and a half for a lot of people in Texas. Are you one of those folks, one of the one, one of the third of residents there who's lost power? My apartment building has a backup generator after Hurricane Harvey, so we're extremely fortunate. But um, we can look out from our window and see, you know, broad swaths of the city completely dark. It's really a pretty remarkable sight. So what does that mean for, for people who, who can't get heat right now? I mean, it, we're talking like very cold temperatures, uh, you know, once in, in decades low temperatures that we're seeing in parts of the state right now. Um, what what does it mean for those folks? There were a lot of folks who last night realizing um, Center Point Energy was telling customers, you know, if you don't have power now, you're not going to have it probably for the rest of the night. And they were making this decision. Do you get on the highway where, you know, last week we saw a 100 plus car pile car pile up on I-35 and, and risk, you know, some sort of fatal accident? Or do you hunker down at home and, and hope for the best overnight? But you know, those vulnerable populations, the elderly, people with really young children, sometimes that's just not an option. So the, the, the warming shelter up by the city and other localities, um, and unfortunately, even some of those lost power early yesterday afternoon. So it really was a situation for a lot of people. And, you know, hopefully we've only seen those two deaths, but two deaths is still too many. Um, and it's, it's really a pretty ter terrible situation here in Texas. What are you hearing from the utilities? What are you hearing from state leaders about when people are going to get their power back? We've heard um, this afternoon, but it does appear to be getting a little bit worse before it gets better. Uh, it's hard to tell because uh, yesterday, so much of the, the websites that kind of track power outages were down, but it looks like there are actually more outages right now than there were at the same time um, Monday. So. Uh, hopefully folks get back online later today. Um, again, these rolling outages that we were warned about over the weekend were supposed to be 15 to 45 minutes, but uh, a lot of folks have been without power since midnight Monday. So it's been a, a really brutal stretch. Hey, can you, can you give some context here? Because I think people who live in colder areas might not realize uh, what it's like to live somewhere where it doesn't regularly snow. There are no, there are not the number of snow plows that are needed to remove snow. There is not the infrastructure to melt snow. People don't necessarily have warm coats because they don't need them, right? Yeah, I mean, there's just none of our infrastructure is prepared for something like that. And that extends to our energy infrastructure, which is why we are in this problem to begin with. Um, you know, in the North Dakota oil field, uh, the entire system is set up to be able to withstand freezing temperatures. But in the Permian Basin, out in West Texas, we weren't ready for that. Our power plants weren't ready for that. And I think, you know, everyone's really quick to point fingers right now and try to blame one thing. Is it natural gas? Is it wind? Is it ERCOT, our grid operator? Who is who's responsible for this? And I think probably uh, the most troubling part is that it's, it's everything. This is really a system-wide failure. And it's going to take a really long time to figure out how best to address this and how we're going to invest in our uh, infrastructure so that this doesn't happen again. Well, to that end, I mean, you are an, an energy reporter here at, at Bloomberg News. Um, take us through the failings very briefly and, and also uh, what leaders are already saying about how to prevent this from happening again. Yeah, I think so. It's important to remember that this isn't just demand driven, that people were obviously super cold when temperatures dropped to as low as they did and wanted to turn on the heat as, as high as they could. And, and folks are already at home because of the pandemic, um, but that it's supply driven as well. And, and you saw oil and gas production come offline because of the frozen temperatures, pipeline operators pulling out of their contracts. Um, and then you also saw failures on the plant level, so power plants that couldn't run, and all that capacity that had to be taken offline. Um, and then you get down to the more local levels, transmission lines blowing and that kind of thing. Uh, and I was talking to someone just recently who said it extends all the way to building codes and insulation and the way that 
uh, Texans keep their energy indoors. Like there's a really big, wide array of failures that led to the situation. Um, and it's definitely going to require a lot of investment. Bloomberg News Energy reporter Rachel Adams heard live in Houston. Hey, Rachel, thanks so much for uh, standing out in the cold for us. We really appreciate it. Stay safe out there. The biggest stories, the moment they happen from around the globe. Subscribe to Bloomberg Quick Take now for insight in an instant.